Hello and welcome back to CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. In the last few videos we've looked at the details of the process layer to memory and how a process starts and is terminated. Before we move on to process control and process relationships, we will spend a few short minutes on two additional aspects of every process. Its resource limits, which we've recounted in an earlier lecture, and its process ID. We can inspect the process's resource limits via the ulimit command as shown here. These limits describe, for example, how long a process is allowed to hog the CPU, how much memory it may allocate, how many child processes it may create, or you may remember this from our little experiment earlier in the semester, how many file descriptors a process may have open. Let's see. How does the ulimit command work? Let's pull up the manual page. Ah, that gives us section 3 of the manual pages, library functions. Let's try again and ask explicitly for section 1 to find the command. Hmm, no manual. Wait, where's the command? Ah, it's a shell built in. Alright, let's take a look at the implementation of the function in the C library. Here, in libc, we find it, and we see it's not really all that complicated. It calls get our limit and set our limit, but only appears to operate on the file size limit. But our shell is clearly capable of setting other limits. So perhaps it's best if we look at the implementation of the built in in the shell. Here, in user source bin sh misc built in.c, we see the different supported limits listed as options in the command. Which are then defined in um, user include sys resource.h. Let's jump there. Here we go. So now going back to our manual page for the ulimit library function, We note that this function is obsolete, and instead we are directed to use the get our limit, set our limit syscalls, which we've just seen is indeed what is being used by the shell built-in ulimit command. So let's take a look at those. As we saw in the code, a resource limit is specified as a soft limit and a hard limit. When a soft limit is exceeded, the call in question may simply fail, or the process may receive a signal, but is allowed to continue if it catches the signal. When a hard limit is reached, the given resource cannot be increased. Using a setter limit to change the limit follows these rules. A soft limit may be lowered by a process, or raised to a value lower than or equal to the hard limit. However, changing your soft limit also always changes your hard limit, meaning if you lower your soft limit, then you're also setting a new hard limit and you can't cross that again later. Only the super user can raise a hard limit. Any changes are made will only affect the current process or any of its children. Which of course explains why your limit must be a shell built in and can't be a standalone command, just like we've seen for the CD command before. Okay, let's see this in action. We revisit our OpenMax example from week 2. Remember, we try to open as many files as possible to see what the limit on the number of open file descriptors was. Here we observe it to be 1024, and ulimit seems to agree. But ulimit gives us the soft limit by default. What's the hard limit? Ah, 3404. So we should be able to bump up the soft limit to any value lower than that. Let's try 2048. That works, and our program is now able to open 2048 files. Of course, we can also lower the limit to say 512, with the expected result. But once we've done that, we now can't go back to 1024, 
even though that was our initial soft limit. This is because changing the limit also set the new hard limit. This is so as to ensure that a process can restrict itself and any of its children without then later being able to remove this restriction. And this approach is similar to how we can change our effective UID to drop privileges permanently. But let's take another example. Let's look at the CPU time. Right now, it's unlimited, meaning a process can hog the CPU for however long it wants. If we restrict this time to 3 seconds, then any program we invoke afterwards should be terminated after 3 seconds of CPU time. So if we then sleep for 5 seconds, what's going to happen? Hmm, we do sleep for 5 seconds. Why did our U-limit not kick in? Well, sleep doesn't really do anything. Specifically, it intentionally suspends the execution for the given time in seconds. So to trigger our U-limit, we need a program that actually does something. Here, let's create a brain dead pointless busy program. All we wanted to do is something. Now, when we run this program, it will get terminated after 3 seconds, plus some overhead where the program was not using the CPU. OK, on to process identifiers. As you all know, every process has a process ID. And every process has a parent process, which also has a process ID. You can inspect these process IDs using the getPit and getPPit syscalls. A process ID identifies a single process running on this instance in time. But note that while the system guarantees that the PID is unique and maps to a single process, it does not guarantee that a subsequent look at the process table finding that process ID is still the same process. Process IDs are reused by the system, so when the process terminates and another process starts, it might get that process's PID. The process IDs are assigned in an opaque manner, that is, you cannot predict what the process ID will be of a new process. It may increment or decrement, or pick a random number. However, there are some exceptions, of course. When the system boots up, the kernel has to explicitly create certain processes. Process ID 0 used to be referred to as the swapper process, sometimes known as SCAT, or System 5 derived Unix versions. It was responsible to swap entire processes out to disk and back in when ready. On Linux systems, process 0 was the idle process, doing nothing but ensuring that oh, there's always a process ready to be scheduled. Nowadays, most Unix systems use PID0 as the system process that handles a bunch of related scheduling things, best left to your operating system class to discuss. Process ID 1 is traditionally known as init. It bootstraps the Unix system, creates all other processes, and reaps orphan processes which we'll talk about in more detail in our next segment. Nowadays, there are alternatives to init that perform this function, and that may be assigned process ID 1, most notably system D, which you will find on several Linux systems. Lastly, process ID 2, notably on BSD systems, was the page daemon, as on-demand paging was a feature introduced by BSD. On some Solaris systems, you may also find this process identified as page out. It's responsible for some virtual memory operations and may simply sleep until physical memory becomes scarce, upon which it scans memory and pages out whatever memory hasn't been used recently. But let's look at getPit and getPPit in action. Here's our trivial example printing the current PID and PPIT. When we run the program, the shell forks a new process and executes this program. The new process was assigned process ID 980, while its parent process ID, the process ID of the shell, is 396. If we inspect all processes on the system, we can see their relationships. The ps command with process ID 1011 has a parent process ID of 396, our shell, which has a parent process ID of 423 which is SSHD, 
that process has the sshd privilege separation process as its parent, which has the ssh daemon as its parent, which finally is a child of init process id1. We can then also illustrate the same relationships as a tree, as we've done before. And observe again how child and parent derive from one another. Okay, time for a break. Let's recap. We've seen that processes are limited in certain ways. These limits are specified as soft and hard limits. A process may lower both, but raise the soft limit only up to the hard limit. Only root can raise a hard limit. We saw that process limits are, as the name suggests, process-specific, which explains why the ulimit command must be a shell built-in. We also started to look at process relationships, but we'll cover those in much more detail in the coming videos. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and until next time. Cheers!